The beauty, 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 five sold American. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, so round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. You said it. Why, sure. Yes, sir. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, so round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Always those words will mean much to you. For, of course, quality is always your first concern. Today, as always, Lucky Strike selects and buys the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobaccos. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. If all it to the American. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man whose name for years has been the epitome of show business. A man who went from Waukegan to vaudeville. From vaudeville to radio. From Broadway to pictures. From pictures to Broadway. And now, since he has no place else to go, (laughs) would you please let him come into your home for just a half hour? (laughs) Thank you. And here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and kids, you're absolutely right. I have been in show business a long time. Why, when I was playing the Palace Theater in New York, Nelson Eddy didn't even have the recipe for shortening bread. (laughs) In fact, when I first started in show business, Charlie McCarthy was taking his physical to get into Sequoia. Well, I was in front of an audience... Hey, wait a minute, Jackson. Don't overdo it. If you want to know something, I was in show business before you was. What? I was in front of an audience when I was two days old. Two days old? Bill, that's ridiculous. Certainly. What could you do when you were two days old? I don't know, but people kept paying admission to see me. (laughs) Oh, Bill. Stop making up such nonsense, Bill. I ain't making nothing up. I was a ninky baby (laughs) baiter. You were what? Oh, I mean I was an incubator baby. Yes, sir, that was me. Two and a half pounds of solid personality. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Say, Phil, I've often wondered about those incubators. Must have been nice and warm in a glass case with a little gas light burning underneath. Nah, first I was hot, then I was cold, then I was hot, then I was cold. Well, I'm a sucker for asking this, but why were you hot and cold and hot and cold? His father kept blowing out the flame and his mother kept lighting it. <laughs> Mary, don't be ridiculous That's exactly what happened (laughs) Phil, you admit that your father kept blowing out the flame And your mother kept lighting it? Yes, and it was a lucky thing I could reach up to that little glass door Why? Who do you think kept handing my mother the matches? (laughs) Now, wait a minute, Phil You were two days old in an incubator Where in the world did you get the matches? The day I was born What? When the doctor grabbed me by the feet and held me up I stole them out of his vest pocket (laughs) Oh, and he must have seen me do it because he gave me an awful whack. (laughs) Oh, for heaven's sake. Phil, you were just born. How can you remember what happened then? I wrote it in my diary. (laughs) Well, that's the payoff. Phil, you can't even write now. How could you write when you were two days old? Maybe he dictated it. Yeah. That's exactly (laughs) what happened. Mary, did you ever hear such silly talk? Phil, Phil was just born, and already he was dictating. I'll bet eight to five he had the stenographer on his lap. Hey, Phil? <laughs> That's, That's exactly, exactly what happened. <laughs> Phil, you don't have to invent a, a fantastic story just to make it sound like you've been in show business longer than I have. Well, maybe he was, Jack. No, nah, that's impossible. I was in show business before anybody. Why, I was on the stage before... before Monty Woolley had a beard. Before Monty Woolley had a beard? Yes. Why, when I was a big hit at the palace, Wooly was still standing in front of a mirror, rubbing his chin and singing, Come out, come out wherever you are. (laughs) I'm 
I'll tell you, kids, I've been in show business longer than anybody. Oh, yeah? How about C. Aubrey Smith? You mean little Aubrey? <laughs> Why, he was only a kid when I was starting out of it. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I'm from Esquire Magazine. We printed a story about you and have all the information in our files except one thing. Uh, what would you like to know? Your age, please. 36. <laughs> but, well, okay. <laughs> now, uh, now, where were we? Well, you were informing us that you were a thespian in the legitimate drama prior to the inauguration of the cinema. Bill, did that come out of you? Yes, and boy, am I glad to get rid of it. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. Now, let's forget show business and find out... Hello, if Mr. Can... Benny. Oh, hello, Larry. Say, you got here just in time for your song. What are you going to sing? Well, I got a letter from a friend of mine in the Navy requesting me to sing I'm Making Believe. A friend of yours in the Navy? Who is he? Dennis Day. Oh, Dennis. A letter from Dennis? Would you like to read it, Miss Livingston? Why, Larry, I don't think I should read your mail. Oh, that's all right. There's nothing about girls in it. <laughs> Go ahead, read it, Mary. Yeah, and we haven't heard from Dennis in weeks. But what's he got to say? Well, here it is. Dear Larry, I heard you sing on the last four broadcasts, and I think you have a swell voice. Well, isn't that nice? I also heard that you're making $22.50 a week, <laughs> which is a very good salary to start with. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Benny will give you a raise almost every year, but it will help to have your mother come down and remind him. <laughs> Especially if she's as big as my mother. Hmm. However, Larry, when you... <laughs> what are you laughing at? When you reach $35 a week, there's no use reminding Mr. Benny anymore because nobody's mother can help you then. <laughs> Dennis always was a card, wasn't he? Yeah. Best wishes always, Dennis Day. P.S. By the way, Larry, I'd appreciate it very much if on next Sunday's broadcast you'd sing I'm Making Believe. That's the part I told you about. Yes, yes, I know. Go right ahead and sing it for him, kid. I wonder why Dennis never requests me to play my violin. I can't <laughs> understand. sung by Larry Stevens, and Larry, that was swell. Keep it up, kid, and some of these days, you too will be making $35 a week, just like Dennis Day did. Gee, if Dennis made $35 a week for a whole year, he must have saved a lot of money. Well, he should have, Larry, but you see, Dennis was somewhat of a spendthrift. 
And he threw most of his salary away on luxuries, like, uh... Like, uh... Like bread and butter. <laughs> Mary, you know what I mean. Dennis could have saved a lot of money if he didn't have that root beer float habit. <laughs> anyway, Larry, come in. Yes? Mr. Benny, I'd... I'd like to try it again. <laughs> again? I'm from Esquire magazine. We printed a story about you and have all the information in our files except one thing. Well, what would you like to know? Your age, please. I told you I'm 36. Look, Mr. Benny, this information isn't going to be printed. It's only for our private files. I don't care what it is for. I'm 36. <laughs> but, well, okay. <laughs> what a persistent guy. I mean, why doesn't he believe that I'm 36? Uh, maybe he was at breakfast at Sardi's the day you won the orchid. <laughs> no, if he'd have been there, I'd have seen him. <laughs> now, as I, as I was saying, Larry... Yes, Mr. Benny? Larry, as the years go by, you'll have your ups and downs. Sometimes it'll be easy, other times it'll be hard. But no matter what happens, just remember those immortal words of John Paul Jones. Don't give up the ship. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Jack, I'm not even going to argue with you today. Well, Don, I'm glad you finally see it my way. And now, ladies and gentlemen... I don't see it your way at all. It was Captain James Lawrence who said, don't give up the ship, but I just don't want to argue about it. Well, neither do I, but it was John Paul Jones. For your information, Don, Captain James Lawrence said, go west, young man, go west. <laughs> So there. What are you talking about? It was Horace Greeley who said that. Horace Greeley? Yes, Phil. Well, how could he say it? Horace Greeley's a statue in Westlake Park. <laughs> Phil, I'm better off if you're on Don's side. Now, Larry, you forget everything that was said and listen to me. Yes, Mr. Benny. As I told you before, and even though you may have your ups and downs, always remember those immortal words of John Paul Jones. Don't go west in a ship. I mean, don't, <laughs> don't give up the west. I mean the ship. Don't give up the ship. Which was said by Captain James Lawrence. Now, Don Wilson, if you say that once more, there's going to be trouble. It was Captain James Lawrence. Well, you asked for it. Hold my coat, Mary. What are you going to do? I'm going to put it on. I'm going home. <laughs> if Don Wilson knows so much, let him run the program himself. Goodbye. Jack, Jack, come back. Here. I'm going home, and that settles it. Good thing I held myself back when I did. If I'd hit Wilson, I'd have knocked him cold. What if he does outweigh me? I can handle myself in a fight. They don't call me old blood and guts Benny for nothing. You know? <laughs> I know when I'm right. And when I'm right, I fight. Say, that sounds like a good motto. I know when I'm right. And when I'm right, I fight. Gee, I wonder if that'll ever become as famous as don't give up the ship. It could, you know. Imagine years from now, people might be saying, remember those immortal words of Jack Benny. I know when I'm right. And when I'm right, I fight. <laughs> say, say, that's pretty good. Yeah, da 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 Hello, Reverend. Hello, Mr. Benny. Yep, Sunday's the nicest day in the week. So calm and peaceful and... Good afternoon, Father. Oh, pardon me. Hello, Bing. <laughs> Maybe I should have asked him if he was going my way. I like him, you know, I do. Hello, Rochester. Oh, hello, boss. Say, you're home early. I know. I left before the program was over. Well, I always thought as long as there was one person left in the audience, you'd stay right on out there. <laughs> That's silly. Whatever gave you that idea? Remember in St. Louis when that man in the front row was swatting flies and you thought he was applauding? Well, what about it? If they hadn't dragged you off the stage, you'd have starved to death. <laughs> What are you talking about? I was going off anyway, even if they hadn't started the picture. 
But boss, I can't get over you leaving in the middle of your program. Isn't that taking an awful chance? What do you mean, Chan? Well, if LSMFT finds out you were AWOL, you'll be glad you saved all those boxes of J-E-L-L-O. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to worry about it now. I'll just sit down and be comfortable. Ah, that feels good. Pull off my shoes, will you, Rochester? Sure, boss. There. Now, give me your other foot. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Wiggle your toes, boss, or the dying misses. <laughs> I know, I went to a movie. Now, uh... Now, I wish you'd go out and fix me something, will you? I feel like I need something to pep me up. Okay, I know just the thing. I'll fix you a super zombie. A super zombie? What's it made of? Uh, I can't tell you the recipe. It's a military secret. A military secret? Yeah, that's the stuff they use in flamethrowers. <laughs> oh, well, I don't want anything like that. Let's fix me some tea and toast. That's yes, all. sir. I'll answer the door. Yes? I'm from Esquire magazine. <laughs> we printed a story about I know, you. I know. Listen. Well, look, Mr. Benny, now that you're in the privacy of your own home and away from those microphones, tell me, just how old are you? I told you I'm 36. Look, Mr. Benny, I've got a job to do, and I've got to go back to my editor with the facts. The facts. Well, I'm trying When to... I show him this, he'll never believe me. I'll be the laughing stock of the office. I don't care about myself, but I've got a wife and two children. Now look, Bud, I'm trying you to tell you the me, truth. You can me, kick me, beat me, but tell me the truth. Think of me. Think of my wife and kids. Tell me the truth. That's all I want, the truth. The truth, Mr. Benny. How old are you? Well, if it'll save your job, I'll tell you the truth. I'm 37. <laughs> 37? Yes. Well, I'll try it. I'll try it. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. Maybe they'll believe me. I hope not. <laughs> what an emotional young man. <laughs> oh, boss. Boss, I've got your tea and toast in here. I'm coming, Rochester. And turn on the radio. I might as well have a little music while I'm eating. Do you want me to do a pan dance? No, just the music will be enough. <laughs> Turn it on, will you, Rochester? nice band. I wish Phil Harris could have heard that. Uh, see, see what else is on the radio, will you, Rochester? Okay. Will Harold live? Will Hilda come back to her husband? 
Will the lost baby be found? Will the bank discover that George has absconded with the money? Will the doctor arrive in time to save Mildred's life? Will Mervyn commit suicide because Cynthia has jilted him? Tune in again tomorrow to hear another cheerful chapter of Happiness House. Hmm. I didn't know that... I didn't know that Cynthia jilted Mervyn. You missed yesterday's cheerful chapter, boss. Oh, yes, darn it. Give me something else, Rochester. Okay. Well, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, in the last minute of play in the big game between the University of California at Los Angeles and the Louisiana State Men's Fraternity Team. Louisiana State Men's Fraternity Team? And right now, the score is 12 for UCLA and 19 for LSMFT. <laughs> oh, oh, them, them. I wish all you folks could be out here this afternoon. What a crowd. You should see this stadium. It's so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> Boy, that place must be jammed. And now let's hear from the cheering section. L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky strike means find the back. Lucky strike means find the back. Find, find, find. It's the dead They must be playing in Goldsboro, North Carolina. And there goes the gun ending the game. Well, LSMFT won again. Got another, get another station, Rochester. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America. This is Walter Winchell doing a special broadcast for the Six Wall Home. Hey, listen, Rochester. That's Walter Winchell. gentlemen, this is the sixth time we are having a war bond drive, but the war is an expensive proposition. There is no way to economize. There are no bargain basements in war, no cut rate sales. Everything must be paid for in cash and in blood. And you are only asked to put up the cash. I know you bought bonds during the other drives, but so did everyone else. Your bond is just as important as your neighbor's. There are no slackers on a battlefield, so let's have none here. Remember, do your share. This is no time to pass the buck unless you pass it across the counter for a war bond. Gee, Rochester, isn't he sensational? He sure is, boss. Yes, sir. And now for some news the time will allow. New Delhi, India. Admiral Mountbatten has exceeded all expectations in the Battle of Burma. He has captured a 100-mile stretch of railroad north of Mandalay. His commandos are striking south of the Irrawaddy. Gosh, that guy Winchell knows everything. Huh? And here's one from the Far East. The B-29s are changing the name of Tokyo Harbor to Bombay. <laughs> what a sense of humor. That's Hollywood, cool. California. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole movie town is talking about a certain radio comedian who lives in Beverly Hills, who tortures the violin, and is tighter than Dorothy Lemore's surround. <laughs> mm. This fugitive from the cornfield who wears a size 44 jersey <laughs> is making a complete and utter fool of himself by insisting that it was John Paul Jones who said, don't give up the ship. What? Because of radio censorship and the laws of libel, I am not allowed to mention the name of this war Keegan Witt, who is making such a joke on himself, but his initials are J.B. Rochester, did you hear what I heard? Did Winchell insinuate that I'm a jerk? That's what he said. That's what the man said. He said that. <laughs> oh, he did, huh? Although he has been corrected dozens of times, ladies and gentlemen, this blue-eyed boob will not admit <laughs> that it was Captain James Lawrence who said those famous words. Rochester, turn that off. Out of my way, Rochester. I'm going to see that guy Winchell right now. Hand me my hat, coat, and cane. My heavy cane. <laughs> Well, Rose, that finishes my special bond program. Yes, Mr. Winchell, and you still have about an hour and a half before your regular Jurgens broadcast. Yeah, look, I'm going over the script again. You run out and get yourself a cup of coffee. Where is he? Where is that? Oh, there you are, Winchell. Why, Jack. Jack Benny. It's good to see you. Don't give me that good to see you stuff. What is all that you said about me and John Paul Jones and don't give up the ship? Now, wait a minute, Jack. Just a minute. All I said was that a certain War Keegan wit who is stingy, tortures the violin, and wears a size 44 girdle, is making a jerk out of himself and the initials are J.B. Well, what makes you think I was talking about you? <laughs> well, for one thing, the initials J.B. But, Jack, I might have been talking about Joan Bennett. 
Joan Bennett doesn't wear a size 44 girdle. <laughs> to think that you would do this to me, Walter, after all I've done for you. What did you ever do for me? Plenty, but not anymore. Yesterday was positively the last time I'll ever wash my toupee in Jergens. <laughs> and another thing, Winchell. Now, Jack, that's no attitude today. Suppose I did mean you. I wouldn't have mentioned it if I didn't know the facts. Oh, so now you know everything. Who do you think you are, Luella Parsons? <laughs> I know my rights, brother. Oh, Jack, calm down a little. Aren't you getting a little too excited about this? No, I'm not, because I believe in those famous immortal words. I know when I'm right. And when I'm right, I fight. <laughs> Who said that? Jack Benny, why don't you read your history? <laughs> Who said it? All right, Benny, I try to be patient with you, but now I can get tough, too. Just who do you think you are trying to change history by saying John Paul Jones said don't give up the ship when any schoolboy knows it was Captain James Lawrence? Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you something, Winchell. You're not gonna... Pardon me, Jack. Certainly, Walter. <laughs> yeah? Winchell speaking. What? Your wife had a baby this morning, but how could she? You promised me it wouldn't happen until next week's program. <laughs> oh, never mind. It's too late to apologize now. Hmm. Now, getting back to you, Benny, everybody on your program knows what, that you're wrong about John Paul Jones. But because you're the boss, you bully them and shove them around and make them take orders from you. Well, you can't do that to me. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you something, Winchell. You're not going to... Pardon me, Jack. Certainly, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Winchell speaking. Yes. Hmm. Yes. But, Elliot, I told you you can't keep a secret all week long. Oh, all right, congratulations. Hmm. Now, getting back to you, Benny, why don't you admit it like a good sport instead of acting like an arrogant boob? It's guys like you with big mouths and little brains who think they know it all. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you something, Winchell. You're not going to stand there and... Wait a minute, how come that telephone never interrupts you? <laughs> now, listen, Winchell, if there's anything but the famous saying in Navy history, I might admit you're right. But I know Navy history. I was a sailor in the last war. But so was I. I was a sailor in the last war, too. And let me ask you something. Do you know anything about Captain James Lawrence? Well, I... Uh... That's what I thought. Now shut up and let me tell you something about him. James Lawrence was born in Burlington, New Jersey on October the 1st, 1781. He entered the Navy at the age of 17 and rose to the rank of lieutenant four years later. He fought on the Enterprise in 1804 during our war with Tripoli. We? Oui? We had a war with Tripoli? <laughs> Stephen Decatur selected Lawrence as his first lieutenant. He commanded such ships as the Argus, the Vixen, and the Wasp. Wasp. In 1813, well, I mean, commanding well, the Hornet, about John he Paul? distinguished himself by capturing the enemy ship, the Peacock. I know, but the Peacock... As a result, but John he was Paul commissioned Jones captain was in there and received a you know. gold medal from Congress. On June the 1st, I know, but what about Paul? John Paul Jones. Lawrence, commanding the Chesapeake, sailed to meet the enemy ship, the Shannon, the Shannon. about 30 miles away from Boston. Well, John Paul Jones was in Boston, The enemy know. crew was better three, but that didn't stop the courageous and the confident Captain Lawrence. Well, John Paul well, Jones, you know, was courageous. You know, just to go to Captain Lawrence. The Chesapeake lay helpless with Captain Lawrence. What, what was Lawrence doing? Just, I mean... As his men carried him below, he I beseeched suppose... them to keep on fighting by saying... Don't give up the ship. Well, all right. Later, suppose... the same war cry was used by Captain Perry I don't care in the Battle Captain of Lake Erie. Or... But it was Captain James Lawrence who said it first. I know, but I don't care. care. I don't care. Sold American. Independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen present at the auctions now open in the South can see Lucky Strike consistently select and buy the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. And this fine Lucky Strike tobacco means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's programmer, Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. At 44, sold and American. And Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. At 43, darling, and my is sold to the Morgan. This is Basil Risedale speaking for the makers of Lucky Strike. L.S. M.F.T. L.S. M.F.T. L.S. M.F.T. Yes, Lucky this Strike is means fine broadcasting company. K.F.I. Los Angeles.